Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with Movement System. Today we're gonna to talk about strength conditioning for MMA, mixed martial arts. If you've been following along for the last three videos, we've been doing a program design series where we talk about program design and sport analysis of cricket, basketball, soccer, and now we're going into mixed martial arts. So the way this video will work, we're gonna go through a needs analysis of the energy system needs, the movement needs of an MMA athlete. Then we'll jump into some different training approaches and we'll review the program that I wrote for mixed martial arts at the end of this video. This video has been a very heavily requested topic, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so the way that we start programming for any sport is with a needs analysis. So we need to figure out what do MMA athletes actually need? And we're gonna do this in two ways. What do they need from an energy system perspective? And then what do they need from a movement perspective? Okay, so from an energy perspective, most of our MMA athletes are gonna be competing anywhere from three up to maybe 10 minute efforts. So really the length of the effort or length of the event is what we're gonna primarily use to determine the type of training that we're gonna do from an energy system perspective. So the primary energy system for MMA is gonna be this anaerobic glycolysis system with a lot of power and ATP slash PC system thrown in there. So MMA athletes are gonna need a lot of power, but also a lot of anaerobic conditioning, and we're gonna to have to decide on our training based on those needs. Okay, so from a movement perspective, when we compare MMA athletes to most field sport athletes or running athletes, MMA athletes are gonna need more end range control, mobility, and strength through a greater range of motion than the average athlete. So really getting into deeper squat positions, uh, more rotation through their trunk, uh, a lot of those positions that our typical athletes may not actually need to get into if they're just like a linear, you know, sprinting athlete or something like that will need to be trained for our MMA athletes. Okay, so one way to analyze the sport is with the force velocity curve. And the force velocity curve is basically just a representation of the inverse relationship between force and high effort. So things like a one rep max squat or a really heavy push of some sort or pull versus something that's really fast. So on the other end of the force velocity curve is max speed work. So anything that's done at very, very maximal speed. And then there's a bunch of sports that fall anywhere in between. So as you can see on this force velocity curve, we have on the very top, the power lifters. So someone who's just competing in a one rep max, doing really just max effort is their most sport specific work. And on the very other end is very high speed. And that would be something like a sprint. And you can see all the other sport disciplines that fall in between. And this is just my judgment of the sport. You can argue that different aspects of the sport might put them you know, higher or lower. But generally speaking, our baseball players need to move pretty fast. And generally speaking, our football players are going to be more powerful and hitting into other players. And then when we think about MMA, it's actually interesting because when we think about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where we're moving other players and having more forceful, slower movements a lot of times in groundwork, that's going to be a little bit higher on the force side of things. Whereas a sport like boxing and Muay Thai are going to be a little bit faster. A lot of the movements of boxing, for example, is avoiding punches, quick movements out of the way. So it's gonna be more on the speed side of that force velocity curve. And this is really important that we understand where the athlete's needs are on the force velocity curve because that's gonna determine the type of training they're gonna prioritize, especially as they approach the season. So on the top end of the force velocity curve, we have just force, but right below that, we have strength speed. And strength speed is different than speed strength. So strength speed with strength first is gonna be a little bit more forceful, a little bit heavier weights that we're still moving with some intent of speed. Whereas speed strength is gonna be lighter weights, maybe 30, 40, 50% of one rep max or a med ball throw or something like that, where it's speed focused with some resistance. So a med ball throw, for example, works in speed strength, whereas a 70% one rep max box squat uh, where you're sitting down onto a box and driving up fast, that's more on the lines of strength speed. And this isn't to say that boxing exclusively needs to be throwing med balls and moving quick. There's a time where boxing will train at the higher end of this force velocity curve, um, particularly as they are farther away from their competition. And as they approach their competition, they're gonna do more technique work and more of that speed focused work. Whereas uh, on the opposite side, for other MMA sports like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they're gonna do more technique work and more force work that's a little bit more focused to their position on the force velocity curve as they approach the season. 
And I actually did a whole YouTube video on the force velocity curve, so you can check that out after this video if you wanna learn more about how to apply the force velocity curve to all kinds of different athletes. Okay, so one topic that is largely misunderstood and improperly trained is conditioning as it relates to mixed martial arts. So, uh, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but there are a lot of good resources out there. One of the resources that was consistently recommended in the strength conditioning study group on Facebook that I run was Joel Jamison's Ultimate MMA Conditioning book. And this book was written by Joel Jamison, who's much more of an expert on MMA conditioning than I am, obviously. But I'm going to just interpret some of the general uh, characteristics of conditioning for MMA and talk about what is generally what we should be thinking about and what might not be quite as effective. But if you want to learn more, you can always check that book out. There is a difference between endurance and capacity. So when we're thinking about MMA, we really don't need endurance. So our athletes don't need to be enduring a low intensity activity for a long period of time. That's what a cross country runner would need, for example. What an MMA athlete needs is capacity of their anaerobic systems, meaning their anaerobic system needs to put out high power output, high force output consistently throughout a competition. So conditioning for the specific demands of building capacity of the anaerobic system means that we need to do interval type training that's gonna involve repeated high effort bouts. And whenever we do these effort bouts without enough rest and they become low effort bouts, that training is no longer effective. That's more endurance training. So if we're doing, uh, for example, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds rest, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds rest, and we're doing that for four, eight, 10, 12, you know, minutes in a row, that just becomes endurance because 10 seconds is not enough rest to actually be putting out high effort bouts. So for example, if we're training on an Aerodyne bike, we may see that the athlete's putting out 700 watts on their first sprint of 20 seconds, but their second sprint is going to be down to 600 watts and then down to 500 watts, then down to 400. And if you keep doing that, just 20, 10, 20, 10 for minutes on end, by the end, they're just going to be at a fairly consistent two, 300 watts, which is way off of their max capacity. So a more effective training system that's going to more replicate the demands of the sport is going to be putting in those effort bouts where the effort can actually be at something that's more realistic to competition. One approach that's really common in training athletes that are anaerobic type athletes is a high-low approach. Coaches like Joel Jameson, uh, Buddy Morris, James Smith use this high-low approach where you're doing some high taxing effort to the CNS system on one day and then doing a little bit more of a low effort day or a low CNS day following that. So you're alternating between these high and low days. Uh, that's not exclusively saying that we're only doing our speed work on high days and we're only doing our max effort work on low days. It may actually be uh, some combination, but generally speaking, we're putting our power, our speed, our strength work that's gonna be high taxing on our high CNS days. And then our low CNS days are typically more low volume strength work, uh, maybe recovery work, accessory work, stuff like that. And this is just one technique for managing CNS fatigue. Uh, there's a lot of different coaches with a lot of different approaches. Generally, when we're doing technique work, speed work, power work that's max effort, we do want to space it out in low volume bouts multiple times throughout the week. For example, a bodybuilder may effectively train legs twice a week and allowing a full 48 to 72 hours of recovery. But when we think about training for max speed, like a sprinter or a long jumper or an MMA athlete who's focusing on these power bouts and uh, these high effort types of training, typically you're better off to do lower volume training sessions five plus times a week if you can. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into this program example and uh, see what I came up with here. So this really isn't a program, it's just two training days, but I'm gonna talk through it and give you guys some ideas of how you might structure a late off season training day versus a preseason training day for an MMA athlete. So in general, our late off season is gonna be having some strength focus, some hypertrophy focus, but starting to introduce a little bit more of that speed strength work. So we might see, for example, front squats at three sets of 10 here, 72% one rep max. That's a pretty heavy load. They're not gonna be moving this super quick. Uh, but that's still a strength focus appropriate for the late off season. Uh, moving down, we're doing chin-ups, four sets at RPE eight. So leaving two in the tank, each of those sets. Uh, and maybe you even wanna throw in an AMRAP, uh, as many reps as possible on that last set. Uh, but that's gonna be a chin-up move there. Uh, I like chin-ups because it's a full range of motion. You're actually getting to that end range elbow flexion, which is gonna get you in and out of like lock positions and stuff in MMA. So that might be just a little bit more effective than pull-ups, not to say that you should exclusively pick one, but that was at least my rationale for picking chin-ups here. 
Um, RDL, just an important exercise to strengthen the hamstrings and get that hip hinge pattern in. Uh, we have a pretty good volume here, three sets of 14. Uh, so you can tell that's kind of a, a, an off season focus. Uh, weighted push-ups, I specifically chose this over a bench press because a weighted push-up is closed chain, you're pushing into the ground. This is just a bit more specific for an MMA athlete who's gonna need to push off the ground, push off uh, another player, and then weighted push-up is gonna allow this to still be loaded at a heavy, effective range. Moving from there into some conditioning work, we have lateral sled drags. We have six sets of 30 seconds, and we're gonna actually load these up pretty heavy here. Uh, we didn't put a weight, but maybe this is, you know, one times body weight or something like that with a strap where you're, you know, stepping foot over foot and dragging the sled laterally just to work into some lateral hip musculature. And 30 seconds is a good amount that we can get the heart rate going, uh, get some good strength work without burning the athlete into the ground here. And then also working a suitcase carry. This is more of an a, endurance actually because we're holding for 75 seconds. Uh, we would actually split that between two hands. Uh, but this is actually focusing a little bit on grip strength, on trunk stability, our QL, our obliques, uh, and all, overall a good uh, trunk stiffness and stability exercise for our MMA athletes off season. All right, and then moving into the preseason, this would be like four to eight weeks pre-competition. So we're getting a little bit more specific work. Heavy med ball throw. There's a lot of ways you could do this. Uh, the way I'm envisioning this for five sets of four is an athlete standing and is actually going to do a forward lunge and a chest pass into the wall. You could also do this kneeling, you could do it overhead, you could do it throwing it up. Um, but either way, moving a heavy med ball actually replicates the demand of pushing an athlete, moving another athlete. So especially for your MMA athletes who are gonna have contact with another player, this is gonna be really specific. For a boxing athlete or an athlete that's just focused on getting contacts and avoiding contacts, that's the, the skill they're training. You may do something that's a little bit more light med ball, a little bit more uh, almost like agility type of uh, training at the start of a preseason for them. All right, and then moving down into a half kneeling dumbbell shoulder press. In this one, we're gonna be in a half kneeling position on one knee. I typically like to hover the other hand and then press with one hand. So this would be a single arm dumbbell shoulder press. Uh, and then just working a little bit more trunk stability in there and a vertical pressing motion. Uh, moving into B2. So uh, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with this programming style, B1, B2 would be a superset. So those would be done back and forth. Whereas A1, it's just A1, so that would be done uh, as its own exercise. So B1, B2 would be a superset between that half kneeling dumbbell shoulder press and a sandbag floor to shoulder. So for that sandbag floor to shoulder, you're gonna get a really heavy sandbag, squat down, bend forward to pick it up, and then actually throw it all the way up over the shoulder. Uh, and then you might do like a little bit of a toss to get back down to the ground. So that's gonna be four sets of eight, four sets of eight for those back and forth. Moving into C1, C2, again, a superset here, uh, working a Turkish half get up. Uh, so again, a little bit more of a rotational pattern and actually pushing forward and up on that dumbbell, uh, pushing the, the uh, dumbbell up towards the ceiling. Uh, you could use a dumbbell or a kettlebell for this one, but Turkish half get up there and then moving into a row. So that inverted row, we're gonna be uh, facing up towards the ceiling. You can use a barbell or maybe some TRX straps and pull yourself up that way. And then lastly, moving into an army crawl plank. And this is a really good one, I think, for a, an anterior core activation exercise. So we're gonna be in a plank position, but not just static. We're actually gonna be moving the arms forward and back. And you could load this if you want to. Also, just the fact that you're moving the arms forward and back is gonna make this exercise harder than just a static plank. So again, this is just one example. And you know, more advanced athletes are probably gonna have much longer workouts than this. But this should give you some idea about how I'm thinking about movement patterns, how you might wanna think about incorporating energy systems, and what might be different from off-season as you approach into the preseason for your MMA athletes. All right, I hope you're enjoying this program design series. If you are, make sure you're subscribed and turn those notifications on so you don't miss the future videos. If you have a sport that you want me to cover, go ahead and drop it in the comments below. And if you wanna learn more, you can check out the Movement System Podcast or the Movement System on Instagram. All right, guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.